as I was coming up the street here, it really occurred to me um, I can't possibly tell BBC anything about the web on mobile because I think you guys have been, uh, you know, ever since I came over here in 99, uh, even before then, really, um, the, the kind of pioneers of, of putting great content and user experience onto, onto the mobile web. And, uh, and so from, from that perspective, you know, I can't really teach you guys anything. But maybe what I can do is I can give you a little bit of my perspective, having worked on the mobile side of things and in the web standard side of things, and tell you a bit about what's going on with, with um, Firefox OS and how Telefonica and Mozilla are working together on Firefox OS. And um, this is intended to be pretty, pretty uh, casual. So if you have any questions, feel free to, you know. Um, and if I'm getting too technical, uh, let me know. If I'm getting not technical enough, let me know. Um, that kind of thing. So, uh, so I'm, I'm just going to start off. OK. Um, so um, this is a slide. I already, Murray might have seen it before. I don't know. But I presented it at Yahoo Hack. Um, uh, and it really it struck me that uh, five, five years ago at uh, Web2 Expo, um, I made a prediction that within five years, uh, the majority of web usage worldwide would be mobile, right? And indeed, it seems like this year we are turning an inflection point of some kind because uh, this uh, tweet from Stephanie Rieger uh, is just one data point, right? She was, she was tweeting it, that she's starting to see more and more of her clients who are mostly in the travel space. So that's an interesting space to be in for, for mobile. Um, that, uh, that more and more usage of the web, usage of their websites, is coming from what we would think of as mobile devices. So then, at what point do we say, OK, now um, the majority of, of the content is from mobile devices? And I actually saw an interesting statistic recently from BBC uh, that uh, was something about, I think it was news. There was some news event, and I don't have the. I don't know that I should have brought it with me, but I don't know the detail here. But it seemed to indicate that also on at least on some BBC property for some portion of uh, time period, uh, you were seeing as many, if not more, hits from mobile devices than from um, from regular what we would consider regular PCs, you know, including laptops and that kind of thing. Well, so 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 what's the point? The point I'm trying to make is that the web is mobile, right? Um, we need to stop thinking about the web as a uh, as a desktop bound medium with um, with a mouse pointer and uh, you know uh, bound to the user interaction paradigm on the, and and the usage model of uh, uh, of the of a laptop or a PC experience, um, this uh, image is stolen from Brad Frost, who's a great uh, user experience kind of guru around mobile web stuff. But um, I just love it because it it it's not even all the different types of devices that we're currently seeing the web on because actually there's also gaming devices um, which are playing a really interesting role. Um, but uh, so now you know we have the web on TVs, we have the web on netbooks, we have the web on tablets which introduces a whole new interaction paradigm of touch um, and uh, obviously on phones uh, and, uh, and of all kinds. Right, so the, the web is a mobile medium. But um, Web apps in in the in the in the area of interaction and applications, um, web apps are still playing kind of second class citizen to uh, to smartphone uh, to uh, on smartphones rather to to regular apps. So um, there's a lot of confusion right now in consumers' minds about what's the difference between apps and the web, and am I use if I'm using the Twitter app, am I using the web, am I you know, and frankly speaking. As technologists, we don't even have very good answers to these questions because there's no there's no really definitive definition of what is the web. Now, some people think it's one thing, and other people think it's the other thing. Um, consumers are increasingly being driven towards apps and app stores. So you've seen movie posters, for instance, the Star Trek campaign most recently, where they said, "Go to our, go you know, download our app. Go to the app store, download our app in order to find out more about Star Trek, whatever." Very bizarre kind of campaign, I thought. So why not just put the URL on there and people can discover your app? But anyway, um, so in the in the process, uh, we're kind of losing um, what 
something that the web has given us, which is interoperable, interoperability, uh, freedom, and choice. Um, and I think that this element of choice and user choice has been one of the things that's driven the web. And I was involved in some of the early days of the web. Um, in the late 90s, I was working for AOL for a little bit. And it was interesting because even then, it, it was clear to everybody else that the web was the medium that was going to win out uh, in terms of um, uh, win, winning consumers' um, hearts and minds. But even then at AOL, um, it was still, there was still the mindset that the web was a feature of AOL. All the regular stuff was on AOL. And by the way, you can have this web thing over here, which is really not very good. So, but the, you know, as it happened, that mindset has gone away. We, we can't even imagine thinking that anymore. But we're kind of going back there almost, going back to that mindset now with the rise of apps and app stores. And this is one, one of the things that, um, that I think, uh, or one of the areas that I think, and I'll get into this um, in a little bit, I think Firefox OS is fighting back against. Right. So a lot of this might start to sound like the old native apps versus web debate, which I have been through for the last three years. I've been on so many panels and talking about apps versus web. And I uh, am very bored of this debate at this point, right? It, uh, to me, it's, um, it, it's, it's a very old debate. And it's kind of philosophical, because it has to do with really using the right tool for the right job. But um, and, and also, uh, web apps, to be absolutely honest, have had uh, a handicap right? Up, up until now. So web applications have been primarily based in the browser. They're rooted in the browser. The user has to run the browser and then go to your, um, to your application. So that's an extra step. And it's not, in, it's not as intuitive um, from, a, from a purely mobile user experience standpoint. Um, the web is not had access to device APIs. So um, you can't, up until, you know, I guess it was 2007, that was when the geolocation API came to the web. But before then, you didn't even have geolocation. Now, uh, we still, on major, you know, shipping browsers on here, you still don't have access to things like the accelerometer, um, getting the camera image directly, that kind of thing. Uh, the web has not uh, been very good with touch. So the web, as a series of standards and a series of technologies has really been built from the ground up to support mouse-based interaction. And all of the event, if anybody's familiar with DOM events and, and you know, the, everything is mouse over and um, on click and stuff like that, right? So um, now we're actually moving beyond that. Um, techniques for responsive user experience have not really been uh, very well developed, although this is another area where BBC, I think, is, is ahead of the curve in terms of um, the whole kind of cut the mustard men mentality, which I think which is, 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 is great, I think. Um, and uh, JavaScript frameworks have generally been oriented towards desktop. So anybody who's using a JavaScript framework like uh, jQuery, um, it hasn't really been optimized for, um, for mobile devices. But now the web is catching up, and apps in the process, apps are starting to remind me of something. This is, this is a little bit of a wink. But I mean, apps are really starting to remind me of, of cartridges um, because they're, they're tied to a, a platform. Um, they're something that I think is, gonna, is going to um, not stand the test of time as far as the, the, the set of technologies that we, that we use in, the, in everyday life. Um, and app fatigue is setting in, right? So how many apps do people use regularly, right? It, everybody has an app graveyard on their phone where they have all the apps that uh, they don't really feel like deleting, but um, you know, I never use that one. Um, you know, where did you, where did, where have you stuffed your Compass application? If you have a, if you have a, actually, I use my Compass application a little bit. But um, uh, and do we really need apps for? Do apps make any sense for news? You know, for or for content delivery in general? Um, Social content consumption and sharing zings you between apps and web. This is a big uh, issue for me that I find personally, and it makes me think, how does anybody use this, right? So you're in a, you're in a Twitter application. You 
uh, somebody shares a, a news story with you or a link, you click on that link, suddenly you're outside, you're in the browser, or maybe the link is to, an to a Financial Times story, um, but now I'm in the browser viewing a Financial Times story, but actually I have a Financial Times web application installed on my phone as well, so that's a completely discontinuous experience for me. Or maybe um, I am put into a context where I no longer have the credentials from some other social network, so now I have to start, um, you know, if I'm put in, if I'm sent to a Facebook link, then suddenly I'm on a Facebook page in the browser, but normally I don't use Facebook in the browser because I'm using the app all the time, so I have to type in my password in order to see this, right? So, th so th this kind of thing happens all the time, and it's because we're zinging people around between apps and web, and there's no, there's, there, there's no real um, coherency to it. Um, and there's plenty of door slams. This is a term that Errol Balkin coined, which I really like. The, um, the idea of uh, you come to a website, <laughs> you know, because you just want some information that says, download our app, right? It's a great XKCD on this one, too. Um, you know, download our app, and then, and then the two buttons are no, and the other one is uh, or uh, yes or no, but ask me every time, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> like, um, and then, uh, so then we also have to ask what value is an app store bringing between users and services, right? So if I have a brand and I want to get my content out to a user and I want to engage a user, why am I sending the user to an app store? I had a very interesting experience with a local, my local mini cab company, right? Uh, all I wanted to do was book a cab. Um, I went to their website. It said, download our app. Um, I said, okay, fine. So I clicked on the button to download the app. It said. Now, I happen to be authenticated in the Mac app, in the Apple App Store as a U.S. user um, because I have a U.S. credit card in it, you know. Um, but so it, it said, oh, that app isn't available to you, right? And then it put me on the front page of the, of the, of the App Store, right? So then what am I supposed to do at that point, right? So uh, it, it, there, there are plenty of examples where the App Store just gets in the way um, especially between services and users. And, and I think this is something that, and it's reminding me of, of this pre-web thinking that, uh, that I described from uh, AOL and Microsoft Network and all of these kind of pre-web portals where um, they think that they have to get in the, in the way in, into the value chain. Also, though, um, apps have something, uh, sorry, web has something to learn from apps, right? So people like apps. There's an emotive uh, connection. There's a feeling of ownership when you have something on your phone, uh, and you can just tap it, and it, and it happens automatically. Um, having an install step um, conveys some meaning, so it might uh, convey additional privileges to the application. In fact, people seem to um, connote or, or, or to, to connect uh, the idea of installing something onto their phone with um, granting additional privileges um, and expectations of use as well in terms of can I use this application while I'm offline. Um, and access to more APIs equals a richer experience. I mean, this is pretty uh, simple. Um, but uh, when you can enable the, you know, a, a different user experience through, through touch or through shaking or through orientation change or location or, or, or other types of things that you can get um, through the, uh, the native API set, then you, can, um, then you can provide a richer end user experience, right? So, and also touch UI is different from mouse driven UI. I already touched on that, so to speak. Um, so what's good about the web? The web has staying power. Uh, it's built on open royalty free standards. That's pretty important from my perspective. I work in the standards space, so I, I, I represent Telefonica and W3C and I, I co-chair um, something called the W3C TAG, which is a kind of technical steering group within W3C. For, for web standards, um, and it's built on a, a community. It's built by a community of Im uh, implementers internationally. Um, unfortunately, one less implementer now that we've seen Opera drop out of the game. But uh, interesting stuff happening there with Yandex actually um, in Russia. Uh, so it's open to all content providers. It's open to all developers. If you don't like it, um, a particular implementation, you can fork it in. Um, in open source terms, you can create your own version. You can you can uh, augment it and add your own features, uh, and it gives people a choice of content. So my perception, having lived through the early days of the web, is that um, 
a lot of the business money was focusing on the, um, uh, was thinking about the inter information superhighway, so to speak, as a, as a kind of a cable TV model of content delivery, where uh, a service provider would have a deal with a content uh, uh, company and would then provide the end user that content, right? And that's that, that cable TV model. And what we end up with instead is, a, is, is the internet model, is the web model, which is much more open and allows access to all kinds of um, alternative sources for news and information and, uh, and connection that uh, that cable TV model could never provide because you, it just doesn't scale to, to, the, to the internet level. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna talk about the architecture of the web. Um, so, uh, but, well, suffice to say that one, one of the key elements of, of that architecture is the identification, is the URL. Um, and things built on top of the URL, um, you know, that, like I said, there's no formal definition of what is the web. Um, but in general, stuff that's built on top of URLs is, fits into that, into that bucket. Uh, <laughs> This is probably not very visible, but this is a great um, poster by Paul Downey, uh, who used to work for BT, and uh, it's about the importance of the URI, and the, U the URI is the, is the key architectural principle of the, of the web, really. Um, and if anybody wants the URL to that, I'll, or URI to that, I will, um, I will uh, give it to you later. Let's see, so what could, a a web future look like on, on mobile. Um, web apps uh, that can be used in the browser or installed onto the home screen. Um, visit a web page and it might ask you, do you want me to install as an app? Or it might provide the opportunity to install as an app rather than download our app, door slam, more of a gentle, do you want to install this application? Um, installed web apps can pop up in a Chromeless view and they can access privileged APIs, right? Uh, you get a plethora of, plethora of app stores available, or uh, users can buy apps directly from a publisher. So, or 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 can be or apps can be distributed from any point on the web. Um, I think there is still a role for app stores, and that's and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Firefox OS. On Firefox OS, there is an app store. It's the Mozilla App Store. Um, there is a role for that kind of central distribution, but it has to be anybody has to be able to build and distribute an app store um, in order for it to really be the web. Um, web apps that invoke telephony functions and other types of private APIs, uh, that's an interesting one um, and could enable all sorts of new user experiences that we don't currently have even on, even on advanced smartphones. Um, privacy from the beginning, um, so one of the key features of Firefox OS, for instance, is um, uh, do not track. Um, do not track preference right on the right on the home of the preferences uh, screen, and apps built with a responsive design across device types and form factors, so tablets, um, phones, etc., and and also different devices, different, um, uh, you know, what what we have here are two advanced phones, right? Um, one of them has the Firefox uh, engine on it, and the other one has a, an engine built on uh, Safari. Um, on top of WebKit, right? But as we'll, uh, but there are many examples of good web apps that function across those different implementations, completely different code bases, completely different um, developers. So this is where we come to Firefox OS and, and kind of, um, I'll give you a little bit of an intro. I mean, the Firefox OS is a new phone operating system primarily by Mozilla. Um, all apps, including the dialer, including uh, the camera, uh, and the contact book, and everything like that, is is a web app. Uh, they're all built on top of the Gecko layer, which is the um, renderer within the Firefox browser. Um, and the original name of the project was Boot to Gecko because you kind of boot the phone up and Gecko runs, and then everything runs on top of Gecko. Um, everything is open source. It's open for tinkering. It's all in GitHub. Um, there is a marketplace, as I said, uh, it's uh, being run by Mozilla, but the vision for it is definitely mu much more distributed and open. Um, 
optimized for low-end smartphones. This is kind of part of the rollout strategy for it. So this uh, phone that I, that I have with me is a developer preview by a company called uh, Geek's Phone, um, and it, it called the Keon. Um, this phone can be purchased when it's not out of stock for 79 euros, something like that, I think. Maybe it was maybe it was 99 euros. I can't uh, I, I can't remember now because it, I have a lot of price points in my head and I'm not one of the business guys. But anyway, it's sub 100 euros, um, and that's unsubsidized. Um, you know the the price for the unlocked phone. Uh, I believe the ZTE device, ZTE sorry that um, uh, that is being sold in Spain through Telefonica stores is 69 euros, and that is. Um, it's not subsidized, but it is locked to um, Telefonica, um, unfortunately. So that's a slightly less open uh, than we would want, but that's a decision that Telefonica in Spain took. But um, there are other uh, devices by uh, Alcatel. There's one by Huawei coming out, um, and I'm missing somebody. There's, there's also some work going on between Mozilla and Foxconn, which you might have heard about, about a, um, a tablet. Um, I haven't been involved in that project. Telefonica isn't involved in that project, but, um, but I think it's very interesting and exciting. Um, uh, so, sorry, the point of aiming for low-end devices is to be able to make it work on devices that can be sold in markets where uh, there is a large part of the population that is, all, that is not already on smartphones, right? So they might be looking for, to upgrade from a, from a feature phone um, to a web-capable phone or to a, uh, what we would call a smartphone, a modern phone. Um, and Telefonica is particularly interested in markets in uh, Central and South America, so Brazil uh, and, and Mexico and, and all those countries. Um, Deutsche Telekom, which is another company that has been working with us and with Mozilla on this, um, is looking at launching in, I think they launched in Poland, and they're going to be launching in some other uh, countries. And then we have Telenor, which is um, active in, uh, country, in some of the Eastern, former Eastern Euro European countries, uh, and they're going to be launching there. So, so it's, that's kind of what the commercial rollout plans are in terms of operators rolling these out to stores. Um, but the idea is to have it in, in all markets uh, from a Telefonica perspective by uh, uh, next year. Okay, so um, this is just intended to demonstrate the, uh, the kind of uh, workflow. Um, how do you develop something for Firefox OS? It's very simple. You have your Firefox browser up here. Um, you have a simulator which you can spin up and you have kind of your regular web debug uh, uh, capabilities. So it's, it's all the tools that you're used to working with already as a web developer, um, as opposed to a kind of, um, uh, you know, SD, a monolithic SDK, right? And actually, I have the, f the simulator here, um, which you can, you can kind of just run it within the Firefox browser and I can demonstrate one of my favorite apps, which I use on both these devices right now, is Forecast, which is a weather application which famously launched direct to users through HTML5. Um, um, so that's great. And then one of the other applications that we like to demonstrate is Cut the Rope, but I won't demonstrate that here because it's much more interesting. I'll, do, I'll show you in, uh, after the talk. Um, so you can see that the you can you can kind of build, test, develop all within the Firefox browser, or you can actually connect a device uh, on here, and it'll, and then it'll actually show you device connected, and then you can push apps to the device, and you can do kinds of debugging remotely on the device, and so you can you can actually put the device into the testing cycle as well. It's quite it's quite uh, easy to do. Let's see here. All right. Right. So, um, new APIs uh, that allow access to accelerometer, camera, address book, um, calendar, telephony, 
et cetera, are all part of Firefox OS. Um, there's a new security model for pri privileged applications, and this is one of the tricky bits because some of these APIs, such as Telephony, are privileged right now. Um, and that means that you have to submit your application to Mozilla Store and have it approved in order to get, in order to get that application into users' hands, um, which is something that you could argue that's not very webby. And, and I think it's true that's not very webby. Um, I think where we are right now in our mindset is where we're trying to um, protect people from malware. Um, so you could imagine a web application that simply uh, the user goes to that web page and it starts making calls in the background to premium rate numbers and quickly draining their, their credit off their phone, right? And that's something that you could do if, um, tele uh, if the telephony API or the SMS API were not privileged uh, APIs. So um, there's a bit of a balancing act right now while we're rolling out Firefox OS. And I'm, what I'm hoping is that we find a better way to do that that allows those uh, APIs to be exposed to more developers in a more webby, in a more webby way. Um, you have the idea of uh, hosted apps and packaged apps on Firefox OS. So you can either create a manifest file for your application that um, uh, allows it to evidence on the, on the screen as, a, as, a, um, as an icon. Um, or you can go whole hog and completely package up the entire application um, as a, in, in, a fire, in a Firefox OS package. So you can see here, I've actually got two of those, um, those both of those types of applications here. Forecast is uh, simply a hosted app, um, and it's pointing off towards this uh, URI, which has the forecast um, um, manifest file. And this cut the rope is actually all the assets are sitting on my computer here. Um, and it's all zipped up and packaged and, and put onto the phone in that way. Um, both types of apps can be used offline. Um, uh, so, and, and, and a lot of those technologies for offline use are actually not specific to Firefox OS. They're the kinds of things like AppCache and uh, IndexedDB that developers are used to using anyway. Um, icons that represent the web apps to the user, and then the curated app store from Mozilla uh, is there, or you can roll your, roll your own app store. Um, so I think that one of the things that this does, which is in, brings innovation to the web that goes a little bit beyond what you can currently do on other smartphone platforms is, so it kind of blurs the lines between apps and web, or between a phone and the web. Um, you know, why should an app on your phone be different from uh, from the web, why should why you know why um, it, you know how, how can a web app dip into your personal information and use the camera, but also do it in a secure way? Um, and there are questions that we still haven't really answered. Right? Is a Chromeless web app still the web? Right? If I bring up a, a web app and it's and there's no ability to get to a URL bar at the top, is that still the web? Uh, is a packaged web app still the web? Some people are very strongly on the no side of that. I personally don't see, um, I, I think it is possible for a packaged and Chromeless web app to be the web, um, as long as it behaves nicely with other applications that are running in that web context. Um, and uh, and how can I expect, to, uh, how can I tell when I can ex expect to use a web app offline? I think that's something else that we haven't really figured out as a industry across all these different platforms. If you have a web app, that is using offline technologies, how can you evidence that to the user so that they know that they can read their, app, their articles when they're actually on the plane or, or whatever? Um, one of the interesting features of web, of, um, sorry, of um, Firefox OS in particular is uh, building this everything.me search functionality into the home screen, right? So actually, um, you can start on the home screen of the device. You can just start typing something like a uh, favorite band name or, or whatever, and it'll just start coming up with applications um, that could potentially service that request. Uh, and that's uh, that means that um, you know, for instance, uh, you could be pushed into applications that are not currently on your phone, but then have the opportunity to add those applications to your phone if you, if you think they're nice, right? So that's a kind of different 
um, user experience than we're used to on, on apps where you have to kind of download the app before you know uh, whether you want the app or not. Um, and that's because all of these web apps are, are, are web apps. Um, right, so we have some challenges that are still there on, on, the, uh, on the Firefox OS project. So security uh, is one of them. Um, getting beyond the browser sandbox, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned, there are some issues there around privileged APIs that we really need to figure out how to, how to make that more webby. Protecting the user privacy when apps can access their private data, what's the right balance? Um, WebRTC, which is a very exciting um, peer-to-peer video and audio communication technology, um, is not yet on the, uh, on the deployed version of Firefox OS, but it's in test, it's in beta. Um, and there's a lot of platform optimization that we have to do to make it even faster and make it more, uh, make the user experience better. Um, and then app cache and offline operation in general is an area that the web needs a lot of work on, right? So there's, there are some proposals going on in standards right now. Um, there's a lot of engineering effort being focused around this, particularly from Google. Um, Financial Times has been a, a really um, a strong um, innovator in this space, uh, but the stuff that they've done has shown how difficult it is to do a proper offline operation. And I think they, they've also been one of the uh, key players that's been pushing uh, for more innovation in the offline space. So we're, we're hoping for better standards um, there, I think. Um, not here to really toot the Telefonica digital horn, but just to explain why Telefonica is working with Mozilla on this. Um, it's really, uh, the key word is open innovation, right? So this is about um, helping to develop the web as an ecosystem that can play uh, better uh, against the kind of app store models that we're seeing out there. Because we don't think, and I, you know, I don't personally think that app stores are that good for consumers um, or in the long run for innovation. So actually, we're, there was interesting news hap happening this week, which underscores this, which was that Google has now announced that even on, and on Android apps, and Android was supposed to be the op open alternative to iOS, if everybody remembers, they're locking it down so that you can't use any other in-app payment mechanism besides their in-app payment API. So if you wanted, if you wanted to build a, or if you built um, a web, uh, sorry, an Android application using um, PayPal APIs, for instance, you're, you're kind of stuffed. You're going to have to, you're going to have to go outside the uh, Android, uh, uh, you know, Google Play Store, or you're going to um, to have to redevelop it with Androids with with Google's own API. So it's kind of underscores this point about app stores. Maybe maybe they don't even realize it, but they're moving more towards the, the closed end of the spectrum. And this is another reason why I think more developers and more organizations should be looking to the open web to launch. Well, they don't have to worry about the app store. They don't have to think about these factors. And you, you can't be, um, you can't be um, restricted in terms of which APIs you use and which network APIs you use and what kind of user experience you have and what, and what all sorts of other functions, you don't need to be reviewed in order to get an application out into uh, the hands of users on, on, uh, on the open web, including Firefox OS, but also uh, other devices, other um, browsers. Um, so tooting the W3C horn for a second, I mean, all of this stuff is being worked on in W3C. Um, and in particular, I wanted to highlight one really interesting uh, effort that is going on in W3C called the Responsive Images Community Group. So this is, um, I think, particularly useful for, for, for BBC or for news content in general, um, where you want to be able to give the user an image that is appropriate not only for their device, but also for other factors having to do with their context, such as maybe even their um, bandwidth, right? So, so, or whether or not they're roaming. Um, and uh, there's a, I think W3C, the community group that they've, that's formed around responsive images is a really good example of kind of community-based standards in action where people have come together who are really interested in this one topic 
responsive images and are experts in images and how images appear in, in, in the web. Um, and they've, um, and because community groups allow anybody to join and anybody to participate, um, it's really uh, sh shown the value of this, of this idea, kind of opening up the W3C process and uh, uh, to, to developers and to people who are subject matter experts. Whereas I think in general, W3C is, is seen as kind of a bunch of standards, people that are fairly inaccessible and, and the process being pretty opaque. Um, I think that as, more, as we see more and more of these community groups launch, we're gonna see that opening up more um, and more interesting uh, use cases like this being worked on. So, um, and there's some interesting stuff going on around the extensible web effort, which I won't go into. Um, so this is some, some links. Um, that's basically the end of my talk. Um, but I did want to uh, highlight here um, some resources in particular um, the types of APIs that are exposed on, on this device. So you can see all the different types of APIs that we're exposing in a little bit more detail here, such as network information API, so wh whether or not you're roaming, whether you have access to an edge uh, connection or HSTPA connection or whatever. Um, Bluetooth API connecting different devices, I think this could become really important for Internet of Things uh, e ecosystem. Um, Network status API, uh, TCP, direct TCP API, um, telephony API. So one of the things that I'm really interested in is how people can use this telephony API to create new, to create like a new user experience for making a call within an application. So say you're a British Airways um, and you want to be able to have an application that allows the user to say, okay, I want to talk to a customer service agent, then you're having a call which is initiated through the circuit switched call network, right? It's not a voice over IP call, but the user experience is still held within the, um, within the British Airways application or within a branded application. And that's something that you can do with the telephony API. It's something that you can't do on iOS um, very well. So uh, because you're, you're actually pushed out of the um, application whenever you try and make a call into, the, into their own dialer application. So I'm interested to see if people make use of that and how well that is accepted by users. Um, and then obviously other APIs such as, um, and each one of these is kind of color-coded in terms of whether it's non-standard or standard or um, geolocation API that's obviously standardized, um, power management API, vibration API, that's something that's just gone through the standards process within W3C that's uh, already implemented on. Firefox OS and on Chrome, I believe. Um, proximity API, all these different APIs are available basically to the, uh, to, to the end user, or sorry, to, to the developer. Um, and that's really the end, of my, the end of my talk. I will take questions or, yes? So that happens here. Um, so within the Firefox OS Marketplace Developer Hub, um, you submit your app to the Marketplace. You basically build your application, you submit it to the Marketplace, and then it's reviewed. Um, by, and Mozilla is in the process of hiring people to review applications because of they, they, I think, underestimated the amount of review that they would need to, to, to do. But um, then it gets approved onto the market and then people can download it from, from the market. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, that review is looking for? It's basically trying to determine that you're not malware and that you're not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and because, and so, that, so use of some of those APIs requires you to use the packaged API mechanisms, so, sorry, the packaged application mechanism so that um, you're, the whole package can be reviewed so you can't like just submit something as a hosted app that uses the telephony API, and then uh, it gets approved, and then you can ch you can change the code on the back end so that now it now it introduces malware. So this is again, it's a process that is trying to be extra careful right now about malware, and I, I hope to see that changing and becoming more open uh, into the in, in in the future. Um, 
back on that API page, which there's a lot of APIs there which are non standard. Um, the idea. The, the, the idea of record and the, um, the statement of record from Brendan Eich, who is the CTO of Mozilla, is that any APIs that are used on uh, Firefox OS um, should be standard in the future, right? So what that means is that there are efforts going on like within the system applications working group. We're working on um, contacts API, messaging API, telephony API, right? Um, those are not standardized yet. But there's work going on. Actually, they're meeting in Toronto this week, um, working on these APIs. And they're, and they're going to work on other things like um, the calendar API and all these other things are kind of phase two, Bluetooth API. Right? So all this stuff is, is happening in, in W3C. Um, and the commitment from Mozilla is that if there are changes that happen to those APIs through that process, through the standardization process, then uh, they'll, they'll be rolled back in. Absolutely. Um, because Mozilla are co-chairing that group. Uh, Guy Munir from, um, from who works here in the London office of Mozilla is co-chair of that group. And the other co-chair is a guy, Won Sok Lee from uh, Samsung, who's part of the Tizen team. So part of the idea behind this, uh, I didn't talk about Tizen at all, but obviously they have a very strong web application environment on Tizen as well, although they're, they're not as far along in terms of commercial rollout of Tizen devices. But um, part of the idea is that were, that is, the community of, of organizations that are working on Firefox OS, including Mozilla, but also companies like Telefonica that have s a significant engineering investment. I didn't mention that, but we have a lot of actual uh, engineers, developers that are actually working in the open source tree of, of Firefox OS. So our, you know, that, that, that's kind of what part of, um, of, of the commitment that Telefonica has to it. But um, we're working with the guys at Samsung and with Intel, uh, who, are, who are also working on, um, Tizen, on, on the Tizen side of things to try and uh, create one set of web APIs that, that we can all agree on for, for these types of things. But er everything else, everything that's, that is standardized already, obviously starting with geolocation, but also things like um, vibration now, um, that's already standardized. Right? So, um, Well, I don't think there'll be a wholesale change, but I think that I, I, there, there may be work to do for early adopters that, 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 that want to use these, these APIs. Or probably, if you are a web developer and you build something on Firefox OS using, for instance, a telephone API, and then through the standardization process that API changes, there's going to be a deprecation period you know, where, yeah, you can use that older version of the API, but it's deprecated, and now you know, you're going to have to update it by a certain time. Personally speaking, I think this has become part of the web, the idea of you know, um, certain APIs are, do have a shelf life. Um, and uh, you know, as we get more complex, we can't expect everything to be 100% backwards compatible. So. So the way that it works is that when you have an app that is installed, it actually comes up within a separate web context. Um, it's not like a tab within the browser. Because you can have tabs in the browser as well. And then you can switch between tabs. And those tabs can all share a cookie context and all that kind of stuff. But the way, uh, an app actually is bringing, it's, it's, it's as if you're instantiating a whole new browser. Um, and so there's no. Um, forward and backward within the app. Um, you have to, as, a, as, a, as an app developer, you have to, um, you have to manage that. Uh, and, you, and you have access to certain APIs, such as the history API. But you, but you cannot expose like a, a toolbar, a uh, browser toolbar, to the, to, to the end user. So um, right now, actually, one of the things that I suggested was that um, to the end user, we should expose browser tabs at the same level as apps, so that you can kind of scroll through all of your open browser tabs and apps 
because that right now we have this dichotomy between browser tabs and apps, and it kind of flies in the face of what we're trying to say, which is that everything is the web. Um, because from a user end perspective, uh, it looks like you have apps and web. Actually, the apps are just other you know instantiations of the browser. So, does that answer the question? Oops. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. Standards is standards is slow. Yes. <laughs> um, it's it's true and sometimes we have uh problems so related to the um, to the desire to want to have the entire web stack be royalty free because in the process of developing a standard for a particular thing, um, one of the one of the companies that's working on that standard could say, you know what, we're not really going to license our technology or our essential patents on this technology uh, in a royalty-free way. And that's actually happening on the push API, which is part of the, um, the way that you get notifications to the, to the phone. Um, and that's something that is, has stalled the process. So yes, absolutely, that kind of thing can happen. Um, it's up to the kind of goodwill of the companies involved to try and make, to, to push past that. Um, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So I, I think, I'm, I'm fairly positive on the process right now. I think it's, it's working pretty well. I think you can also point to some really good examples such as geolocation where, uh, and vibration also most recently, um, where it has worked very well, I think. Um, it's not perfect, and I think that also it, it kind of points to the, to the reason that we're, we are where we are right now. Innovation on, on one platform, um, which is a controlled platform, um, can be much faster, right? So you can get suddenly all of these applications that are using the accelerometer for you know, for, for, for driving games or stuff like that, right? And because Apple can do that, they can just, um, or Google in the case of Android, can, can expose an API like that. They don't have to go through a committee process, right? Um, so that's why we, we're, we've seen this huge explosion of innovation in terms of user experience and form factor and, and that kind of thing. But what I see happening now, so, so, I, so it, I don't, I'm not, you know, negative on any of that, right? But what I see happening right now is the web evolving at its pace to encompass those capabilities, right? So now what I think we're seeing, or what I certainly hope that we see, is, is a move back towards web-based distribution as well for those types of applications and web-based development for those types of, of applications. Well, I think that so for instance, Apple is a company that is um, perennially schizophrenic with regards to its relationship with the web. Uh, it has, a, I should say, dual personality. So they, they put a lot of effort into the WebKit stack, into open source. Um, and at the same time, they're putting a lot of effort into their proprietary app um, stuff. So it's a complex story. And yeah, I think there, is, there are some competitive tensions there. But I, one, one thing that I keep coming back to is this idea of, um, so everybody in the early days of the web said that um, uh, Microsoft had won uh, the app, uh, sorry, the, the web uh, browser wars, and that was it. There was no innovation left in web browsers. Microsoft IE6 was it, right? And it took Mozilla to actually come out with, even though it was slow, even though it was open source, even though it was, it was, it was you know, it was not a, um, yeah, as I say, it was slower than, the, than Microsoft's product um, iteration. Um, they came out with something that added, that started to add more innovation onto the web, and they kind of re rekindled innovation on the web, and this was in, in the kind of early 2000s, right? And, um, and I think that what we're seeing with Firefox OS, or I think what the goal is with Firefox OS is to play that same role for mobile, right? So if through Firefox OS, we can actually get more people developing for HTML and for HTML5 and for the web platform 
um, across all these different devices, including Firefox OS, but also iOS and Android and all these things, then that's a win, right? That's, that's, part, of, that's part of the point, um, rather than trying to get everybody onto Firefox OS. So. Sorry. Any, yeah? Yes, you can develop. Uh, uh, yes, that's the, 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 can, can, so. Can you develop a, a website and develop it as a? I mean, it's kind of the same thing. It's you can you can build a website and then uh, create a manifest file for it, um, which is hosted at your same um, website uh, web location, um, and which is what Forecast.io did, right? And then uh, your you can then use certain APIs to determine whether your web application is installed or not, and you can provide the end user uh, with a prompt or with some kind of, you know, whatever user experience you want to provide them with that says, um, would you like to install this application? And then it, will be in, it can be installed onto your phone. Or the end user can say, uh, I want this web page installed on my phone as, a, as, a, as an icon, and that's another, it's an alternative way. And then you don't even need a, a manifest in that case. You can just install it. And, and you can make that decision within the, within the logic, yeah. within the app, about which APIs you want to be able to use and which APIs you think you can use based on, um, on whether or not the application is installed, on whether the user is authentic, has authorized you to access the location or whatever. You can provide them different um, experience options. Um, so yeah, that, that is kind of the idea. And I would say, I mentioned FT before. Um, it's interesting that when we asked them to, t to see how they could get their FT web app working on Firefox OS. Um, I asked them to come give a talk at a hack that we did in June. And I asked them, well, can, can you give a talk on porting your web app to Firefox OS? And they, say, they told me, well, it would be a really small talk because basically it just worked, which I was very surprised about, actually. <laughs> um, but it, you know, and it, but that, it's a, it was a good proof point because they were m heavily using uh, and they're heavily using kind of app cache and in a really sophisticated way and index DB and, and uh, uh, you know, to grab assets and synchronize and um, creating their own user experience around offline use, which I think is, is as I said, I, th I think it's pretty revolutionary. But it, it works, it all works very easily across. Uh, they only had to tweak the user experience a bit for the, for the screen dimensions right, in order to really get it to, to work on um, Firefox. And I, can I have it here, I can show anybody who's interested. Any other uh, questions? Are we over time? All right, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.